So the title of my talk is uh, Protein Methyltransferase Inhibitors as uh, Personalized Cancer Therapeutics. Um, so I just wanted to uh, give some disclosures. Uh, so uh, I have the following financial relationships to disclose. Uh, I'm a, I receive grant and research support from LLS, MMRF, GSK, ASI, and Celgene. And I'm a stockholder and in an employee of Epizyme. And I will not discuss off-label product use in my presentation, especially because we don't have labels yet. So just to give you a little uh, uh, agenda of what I'm going to talk about, I'm first going to give you some background on histone methyltransferases and their uh, potential th uh, therapeutic value in cancer. I'll then uh, transition to tell you about DOT1L and, and mixed lineage leukemia. And then I'll talk about EZH2 and non-Hodgkin lymphoma. It's kind of a nice follow-up uh, to Lou Stout's talk. And then I'll close out by talking about a role for EZH2 in malignant rhabdoid tumor. So Jonathan Wettstein did a great job of uh, introducing chromatin structure and epigenetics, so it makes my job much easier. Um, but uh, I wanted to reinforce a couple of points. Uh, over the last decade, it's become increasingly clear that the chromatin structure plays a very important role in regulating gene transcription. And additionally, uh, we, we've begun to think of histones not as just structural proteins, but they are, in fact, important nodes in signal transduction. So we're looking here at a blow up of a human chromosome. And what you see at this highest magnification is just a cartoon of the classic bead on a string, beads on a string uh, sort of model. And what you have here is about 150 base pairs of DNA wrapped around histones. And these histones, you should keep in mind, are actually octamers. They're made up of uh, two tetramers of histones H2A, H2B, H3, and H4. And what you can also see in this cartoon is, as Jonathan mentioned, is that there are actually uh, two really uh, distinct forms of chromatin uh, in higher eukaryotes. You can see that there's euchromatin, which has this looser compaction of the histones, and it's transcriptionally permissive. Uh, the transcriptional machinery can access uh, genes in this context, and gene transcription can be turned on and off. Uh, contrast that with heterochromatin, which is more transcriptionally tighter compaction of the histones, and that sort of blocks access uh, to gene uh, transcription. So one of the important uh, uh, mechanisms for uh, regulating chromatin structure is, in fact, post-translational modifications uh, of histones. And so there are a variety of different enzymes which have activity at the level of the histones. And I'm just giving you a, a feel for some of those. Uh, it can be things you're very familiar with, like uh, phosphorylation, ubiquitination of lysine residues, acetylation on lysine residues, and the opposing deacetylation. And then what I'm going to talk about today, which is uh, protein methyltransferases, or histomethyltransferases, which at specific lysine and arginine residues transfer a methyl group to these residues. And so if you look at the, uh, at, at the variety of enzymes uh, which can covalently modify histones, you can see that the uh, histomethyltransferases make about 50% of those enzymes. So here's a view uh, of the human HMT ohm. So this is just a representation of, of the HMT family. So there's roughly 100 family members. And what you can see is that's roughly split down the middle, 50% uh, uh, being lysine methyltransferases, shown here, and the other half being arginine methyltransferases. I should point out that uh, while, histo while lysine methyltransferases, uh, there are a known uh, groups of uh, lysine demethylases that we heard about uh, from Jonathan Wettstein, there are no identified arginine methyltransferases to date. Um, so those are the, the, the uh, search for those is still ongoing if they exist. One other thing I want to point out on this family tree is that uh, one of the enzymes I'm going to talk about today, which is DOT1L, is actually on the arginine methyltransferase tree. It, uh, it actually conducts H3K79 monodyne trimethylation, but structurally, uh, when you look at it phylogenetically, it actually looks more like an arginine methyltransferase. It lacks the canonical set domain, which uh, all the other lysine methyltransferases have. The other uh, highlight here is EZH2, which is a, a lysine methyltransferase, which I'm going to be talking about quite a bit today. So I want to give you a feel, at least at a high level, uh, of sort of a genericized pathogenic mechanism uh, that I'm going to be referring to today. And so what you have here is uh, dysregulation uh, of a particular HMT, histomethyltransferase, and that leads to site-specific hypermethylation, which is represented on this Western blot at a global level. 
And this hypermethylation can then lead to uh, transcriptional changes, either aberrant upregulation or downregulation uh, of gene transcription. And ultimately, this change in gene expression leads to phenotypic changes uh, in the cell, and ultimately, this leads to disease. And for today's talk, we're, of course, referring to cancer. So then I'll give you the, the, the similar uh, genericized therapeutic mechanism that I'll be referring to. So here we have uh, a cancer with a sensitivity or so-called a genetic addiction to a given histomethyltransferase. And we can see the uh, hyper-site-specific uh, methylation at a given histone residue. But if we interview, intervene excuse me, uh, therapeutically with an HMT inhibitor, we can diminish that site-specific methylation and begin to reverse the aberrant gene transcription uh, signature. And this ultimately leads to selective killing uh, in genetically altered cells, but not in genetically normal cells. And ultimately, the hope is this contributes to tumor growth inhibition. So what sorts of genetic alterations confer dependence to HMT to activity? Um, there's quite a wide spectrum of them, and I've, I've listed some of them here. So these alterations can be things such as point mutations, which I'll describe in detail for EZH2. Uh, it can be amplification or increased expression uh, of, of certain HMTs. It can be loss of function of a corresponding uh, uh, demethylase, such as the demethylase UTX, which removes lysine, uh, excuse me, removes methylation from lysine uh, 27 of histone 3 and opposes uh, the EZH2 uh, function. It can also be ectopic recruitment uh, of a particular HMT to aberrant gene locations, and that's the story you'll hear, hear today for, on DOT1L. It can involve indirect tr chromosomal translocations, such as the case with DOT1L, which I'll describe. They can also involve uh, direct chromosomal translocations. So there's a very good example of this in myeloma. The uh, HMT MM set undergoes um, a specific uh, translocation uh, with the uh, immunoglobin heavy chain promoter and seems to be a driver in a certain subset of multiple myeloma. And then finally, uh, probably the harder to define is the so-called synthetic lethal relationships, where you have dysregulation in one pathway, such as switch SNF, and that confers sensitivity to an HMT pathway, in this case, uh, EZH2 or PRC2. So now I'll talk a bit about uh, DOT1L and myxolytic leukemia and our, uh, some of our drug discovery efforts in that indication. So just to give you a little background on DOT1L, as I mentioned, it does not contain a set domain, but it is, in fact, a lysine methyltransferase. And it's believed to be the only uh, KMT which uh, actually methylates histone H3K79. And it can do, uh, in, in vitro and, and seemingly so in cells, mono, di, and trimethylation at that residue. Uh, as far as its, uh, its normal role uh, in, in terms of transcription, it seems to be involved uh, in actively transcribed chromatin and has a potential role in transcriptional elongation. As you can see from this uh, cartoon uh, from a review from David Allison's lab, uh, DOT1L has a number of different binding proteins such as AF10, AF17, and ENL, and AF9. And it can uh, associate indirectly uh, with the PTEF-B uh, transcription elongation complex. So it seems to be involved with uh, uh, transcriptional elongation. Um, but these, these uh, binding proteins that I mentioned are very important, and I'll describe this in just a bit more detail in a moment, but essentially it's these, it's these binding proteins which cause DOT1L to either be directly or indirectly recruited by mixed lineage leukemia uh, fusion proteins. And very importantly, uh, work from Scott Armstrong and uh, Jay Hess and others have shown that the DOT1L enzymatic activity uh, is required for transformation in mixed lineage leukemia, both in the AML and ALL subtypes. So just a bit more about the actual uh, MLL translocations. So MLL is, is, is in fact, uh, a histomethyltransferase. It's uh, located at uh, 11Q23, it's chromosome 11Q23. And what you see is here's the entire gene uh, with a set domain at the very C-terminus. But what happens in the translocations is that this C-terminal portion of the gene is lost and the fusion partner becomes uh, a number of the, of the proteins that I showed you in the previous slide. There are things that either bind DOT1L directly or things that bind indirectly to DOT1L. So this is the mechanism by which DOT1L gets recruited to MLL target genes. <clears throat> and as far as the, uh, the, uh, uh, the incidence of the disease, it's, uh, re MLL is rearranged in about 5% of ALL and about 5 to 10% of AML. Uh, but there's a very high uh, uh, proportion of infant le acute leukemia which have MLL rearrangements. 
And I should point out that there's really a number of different fusion partners that have been described. There's over 80. And um, I'll show you some coverage as far as what we have to date on, on those fusion partners. So just a bit more about the mechanism and how DOT1L is recruited uh, by ML, MLL uh, fusion proteins. Uh, here we have the normal, quote unquote, normal state. So if we're thinking about hemopoietic uh, precursor cells, uh, you have the MLL uh, HMT at its target genes and it's methylating histone H3K4 uh, monodi and trimethylation. And you have a, a quote unquote normal level of H3K79 methylation, which is very low as you can see uh, from this ChIP-seq plot. Um, but what you, and, and so these hemopoietic uh, precursors uh, with this normal level of gene expression uh, can undergo differentiation along the normal lineages. But what you have in the context of MLL is that the fusion uh, protein actually recruits DOT1L by virtue of the fusion partner, and DOT1L is aberrantly uh, uh, methylating K79 monodi and tri, and that's what you see on this uh, alignment here. And this aberrant methylation is leading to a, a prominent upregulation of the, uh, the so-called MLL target genes. And these MLL target genes have been um, well-defined by folks such as Rick Young, uh, Scott Armstrong, and, and others. And uh, two of the, the most prominent members of this uh, signature are HOXA9 and MIS1. Ultimately, the expression of this MLL signature uh, leads to leukemogenesis. So just a, a few more points on the, the actual disease of mixed lineage leukemia in its current, current, in its current clinical setting. Um, it, it has a very poor prognosis, uh, both in the adult context and in the pediatric context. Uh, less than 30% expected five-year survival for both. Uh, we, th these patients do get uh, identified in the clinic currently. Uh, so the, uh, the rearrangements are identified uh, as part of normal cytogenetic uh, workup and, and FISH uh, for leukemia patients. Uh, but uh, one important point is there really is unmet need for these patients. Uh, the current standard of care involves intense chemotherapy and stem cell transplantations. So to that point, we began a number of years ago, about four years ago, uh, drug discovery efforts to uh, find DOT1L inhibitors. And I'm really uh, shamelessly sort of boiling down the, all, all the research and, and drug discovery for four years into this one slide. And through structure-based guided design, we took memetics of, of s methionine, which is the uh, substrate that HMTs use to transfer a methyl group to histones, and we, uh, we did structure-based guided design to arrive at this amino nucleoside analog, uh, which is EPZ5676, and it's our current clinical candidate. So this particular molecule has exquisite potency uh, to DOT1L. It actually has a KI uh, that's in the uh, double-digit picomolar range. Uh, it's also very, very selective. You can see uh, that it's, it's over 37,000-fold selective over other HMTs, and these little circles here are meant to uh, represent potency on the HMT tree. The bigger the, uh, the circle, the more potent uh, the hit is on, on a given HMT. Um, very importantly, the, uh, the effects that we have biochemically uh, do translate into uh, cellular uh, activity, which isn't always the case that you see with some probe molecules. So you can see that we're getting a very nice inhibition of H3K79 uh, methylation uh, in this particular uh, Western blot, uh, the IC50 uh, being around uh, single-digit nanomolar. So as I mentioned, um, some of the, the, there's, there's a key MLL target genes in mixed lineage leukemia. And we've been able to show in MLL rearranged cell lines when we treat with, uh, the, with 5676 or other DOT1L inhibitors that we see a very nice time and dose-dependent inhibition of the uh, target genes, HOXA9 and MIS1. So really blunting the expression of these genes. You can note it does take some time, and that's consistent with the fact that you have to inhibit the enzyme, turn over the mark, uh, and then have the downstream effects on gene expression. I should also point out that I didn't point out earlier, there is no uh, known uh, demethylase for H3K79. There's at least, there hasn't been one identified, so it's thought that that turnover has to occur through um, actual turnover of histones in the cell cycle. So at a more global level, when we've done uh, gene expression analysis, uh, global transcriptional profiling, we see that the canonical mixed lineage leukemia uh, signature is reversed uh, when we treat with uh, uh, EPZ5676. This is a an, uh, an, uh, rearranged cell line. This is MV411. We've also seen this in uh, MOM13s, which is another rearranged cell line. So the effects we have uh, on methylmark and on uh, transcription uh, translate into antiproliferative effects. 
And those antiproliferative effects are specific to mixed lineage leukemia rearranged cell lines. So here in this, pan in this slide, I'm showing you uh, two cell lines. On the left, you see um, MV411s, which uh, have an AF4 uh, translocation. And on the right, you have a non-translocated cell line, just a jerk uh, cell line. And what you can see from the Western blotting at a global level, we're getting comparable amount of uh, inhibition with increasing dose of H3K79. So we know the drug is getting on board, hitting the target, and inhibiting methylation. But you can see that only the, uh, the rearranged cell lines really seem to care, and, and that's where you see the anti-proliferative effects. So it seems to be selective, uh, our effects, to uh, MLL rearranged cell lines for the most part. And in fact, when we've looked uh, more broadly across panels of MLL rearranged cell lines, uh, we've been very successful in showing that, at least uh, in a cell-based context, uh, that we have proof of concept uh, for anti-proliferative effects. And so I'm showing you here in these pie charts, uh, just for, for infant, pediatric, and adult um, MLL, uh, the, uh, the frequency of the different uh, translocation uh, fusions, fusion partners. And uh, the green is meant to represent where we have sensitivity, either uh, using an inhibitor in a cell line or through um, uh, work of our, our collaborator, Scott Armstrong, who's uh, used a lot of engineered systems in, in mouse models to show uh, uh, the proof of concept for efficacy. So the, uh, the cell line effects, um, we can also translate into xenograft models. Uh, and what you're seeing here is a nude rat xenograft model. And you may ask yourself why you're doing nude rat xenograft models. Well, one thing I should point out is that one of the limitations of 5676 is it does have fairly poor oral bioavailability. It's, it's very close to zero. So the drug actually has to be given by constant IV infusion, which you're seeing here. This is a 21-day uh, constant IV infusion at two doses, you either have vehicle, 35 mix per kg per day or 70 mix per kg per day. And what you can see is that if we cease dosing at 21 days and assess tumors, at both doses, we're getting nice uh, anti-tumor effects. And in fact, at the higher dose, uh, there, there are no more palpable tumors. If we then do a washout uh, to see if the tumors come back, you can see at this highest dose that we've really wiped out the tumors. They don't grow back. Whereas this intermediate dose, you're seeing uh, that uh, we haven't quite hit the target uh, hard enough and the tumors begin to grow out during the washout period. Here at the bottom, you're seeing uh, some of our effects on PD at the two doses. Uh, this is looking at, uh, uh, within the tumor at H3K79 methylation, and this is actually looking in a surrogate tissue, the bone marrow uh, at H3K79 methylation. Similarly, uh, the uh, uh, HOXA9 and MIS1 gene expression, we also have nice uh, PD effects there as well. So as I mentioned, uh, EPZ5676 is a clinical candidate. Uh, it's currently in a phase one study, which initiated in September of last year. And we're currently in a dose escalation phase. And so we're currently taking patients with advanced hematological malignancies, including MLL rearranged patients. Uh, this is ongoing at six sites here in the US. Uh, we will be adding additional sites during our expansion phase. And we are, are looking for outcomes such as the maximum tolerated dose, uh, P early readouts on PK and uh, earlier effects on uh, PD. So we're hoping later this year to move into uh, our expansion cohort. Uh, we'll be stratifying for only mixed lineage leukemia rearranged patients, and we will uh, be expanding to up to 12 sites in the US and Europe. And we'll be looking at outcome measures such as safety and getting an early assessment of therapeutic effect uh, in MLL rearranged patients. So I want to share with you some data that uh, we made public a few months back, which was very exciting for us uh, in, in, uh, to occur in our uh, dose escalation phase. So we had a patient that enrolled in one of the early cohorts uh, that was receiving a dose of 24 mg per kg, uh, per, excuse me, 24 mg per meter squared per day, uh, which we believe is really uh, below the therapeutic dose, which we estimate potentially to be somewhere between 54 to, to 80 uh, mg per meter squared per day. Uh, depending on what cell model we base that on. Uh, but what we saw in this patient who had a rearrangement uh, in, in ALL uh, was that we saw a 60% reduction uh, in, in the methyl mark uh, in, in the uh, PBM, PBMMCs. Uh, but what was even more striking is that we saw a biological effect. Uh, the patient had resolution of fever by day five and had a, a marked decrease in blast count. 
Uh, unfortunately, this, this patient had very late stage ALL and uh, began to suffer disease progression into the CNS, so had to come off study. But uh, this was at least a promising result uh, for, for, the, for the drug in this early phase of the trial. So stay tuned uh, as we move into the, the uh, uh, expansion phase uh, for more results to come. So I mentioned that uh, we really only see effects uh, on antiproliferative effects in MLL rearranged cell lines. And that's been true uh, with, with one exception to date. And that is that we have found that uh, a certain type of AML that contains a genetic alteration called MLL partial tandem duplication, or PTD, uh, seems to be responsive to DOT1L inhibitors. So for those of you who are not familiar with MLPTD, uh, what it actually is is an internal tandem duplication within the ML gene where exons 3 through 9 are actually uh, internally duplicated. Now, what's puzzling is there's really no obvious reason as to why this would confer sensitivity to DOT1L. Yes, there's a connection uh, to MLL, but uh, there's no translocation uh, bringing a fusion partner that binds DOT1L on board. So we're still, uh, this is still an area of active investigation for us and for our collaborator Scott Armstrong as to why there could be sensitivity in MLPTD. Uh, it's really only, there's really only one MLPTD cell line that we've been able to obtain today and test, which you see here. We're getting comparable sensitivity uh, in the low nanomolar range as, as we see with the uh, uh, MLL rearranged cell lines. And uh, we also are able to show that uh, we see efficacy in xenograft models with this cell line. We're hoping to bring more uh, MLPTD cell lines on board. There's really only a couple that we've identified in the world. Um, and so uh, we're hoping uh, to, to really pursue this as an area for uh, clinical development. So I'll transition now from DOT1L to tell you more about uh, another story, which involves EZH2 and non-Hodgkin lymphoma. So I could spend uh, hours going over background EZH2 and its connection with cancer, but uh, I really want to uh, get to data. So I'm just going to give you a brief background on EZH2. So it is the catalytic subunit of the so-called uh, polycomb uh, repressive complex 2, which is shown here. It's a multi-protein uh, complex, generally about four uh, members, which uh, EZH2 is the catalytic subunit. Uh, and it generally targets and represses genes involved in development and cell fate. Uh, EZH2 is, uh, is a set domain containing methyltransferase, and it generates mono, di, and trimethylation at histone H3 uh, lysine 27. And there's been compelling evidence in the literature uh, that EZH2 has a role in cancer. It's been shown in a number of different contexts to be genetically altered in cancer. Uh, it's been shown to be an oncogene both in vitro and in vivo, with the catalytic activity being required. And it's been shown through a number of knockdown studies uh, and now small molecule studies to be involved in tumor cell growth both in vitro and in vivo. So going back a few years, um, a group at the uh, British Columbia Cancer Agency put out a paper where they were doing uh, sequencing in uh, non-Hodgkin lymphoma, and they reported uh, some point, uh, point mutations in EZH2 uh, that occurred in about 7% of follicular lymphoma and about 31% of diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, and this was exclusively in the germinal center B uh, subtype, not in the uh, ABC subtype. Also wasn't seen in MCL or any other types of non-Hodgkin lymphoma. And so more recent data has suggested that the uh, frequency of the mutation is probably more like 20% in diffuse large B, uh, germinal center B subtype and follicular lymphoma. But the, the mutation in question uh, was recurrent and it occurred at uh, a specific tyrosine residue in the active site, tyrosine 641. You'll also see this in the literature referred to as tyrosine 646. It just depends on which reference uh, transcript you're, you're using. But uh, this group reported that the tyrosine 641 could be mutated in patients to phenylalanine, asparagine, histidine, serine, or cysteine. Um, but in all cases, the mutation was heterozygous. Only one copy was mutated. And again, it was occurring at a single uh, amino acid. Um, when this paper came out, uh, the group tried incubating uh, recombinantly expressed forms of these mutant enzymes uh, in the PRC2 complex with naked peptide, and by naked I mean unmethylated versions of H3K27. And what they saw compared to wild type is that there really was a blunting of enzymatic activity. So they reported these were loss of function mutations in EZH2. We were somewhat skeptical about the finding, primarily because of the compelling literature on EZH2 and cancer, the fact that the mutation was heterozygous, 
and the fact it was occurring at a single amino acid. So we thought it, there should more investigation should go forward. And so what we did was uh, take the recombinant mutant enzymes in the PRC2 complex and incubate them with uh, increasing methylated forms of the K27 peptide. So in blue is unmethylated peptide, red is monomethylated K27 peptide, and yellow is dimethylated. And what you see for wild type is that it really prefers unmethylated K27 peptide. It's really good at generating dimethyl K27 from monomethyl, less good at taking mono and making di, and even worse at taking dimethyl and making tri. And what you see when you look across the mutant enzymes is exactly the opposite profile. They're not very good at taking the unmethylated peptide and making uh, dimethyl, which is why uh, the uh, authors uh, showed that there really was no activity on unmethylated peptide. But when you start looking at monomethyl, you see increasing uh, activity. And then when you use dimethyl peptide, they're very good at making trimethyl, H3K27 from dimethyl. So this occurred to us that these were probably change of function mutations rather than loss of function mutations. So if you look at the actual um, enzyme kinetics, it really explains why um, a heterozygous uh, EZH2 mutation at this particular amino acid uh, is sort of the perfect storm for giving you a hyper trimethylation. So if you take just wild type EZH2 and you add the and you add uh, naked peptide, you get only a very um, modest or mild production of H3K27 because this particular enzyme is not very good uh, at taking the, the higher methylated forms and making trimethyl H3K27. When you look at the, the mutant enzyme alone, um, it's not very good at taking the unmethylated and generating the higher forms uh, of uh, the more methylated forms of, uh, of uh, H3K27. So you get a really puny amount of H3K27 trimethylation. But when you have an, a mixture, a heterozygous mixture of the wild type enzyme and one of the mutant enzymes, the, the wild type enzyme can generate the monomethyl and the dye, while the mutant enzyme is really good at generating the tri from the dye. And so you get a robust H3K27 trimethylation, and that's represented here. And in fact, when you look in cell models, uh, which uh, essentially are derived from patients and have uh, been sequenced and shown to have uh, Y641 mutations, shown here on the right side of the western blot, what you see is that these cell lines, um, which are uh, diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, germinal center B subtype, you see that they have hypertrimethylation of H3K27 and very little dimethylation, and you see just the inverse when you look at the, the wild-type cell lines. So in thinking about a drug discovery effort uh, for EZH2, uh, we began several years back again uh, to do high throughput screening uh, towards the PRC2 complex. And uh, HT, doing our HTS and following that with uh, iterative uh, SAR, uh, we took our initial hit and we, we drove it to a very potent selective inhibitor of EZH2. And this compound, EPZ6438, also referred to as uh, E7438 to uh, indicate uh, our partner A-size nomenclature. Um, this is a, a SAM competitive, very potent and selective inhibitor of EZH2. So it's about, uh, it has a single digit nanomolar Ki towards the enzyme, and it's 4,500 fold selective over 14 other HMTs that we've looked at, uh, and 35 fold selective over the closely related EZH1. So it's both potent and selective uh, for EZH2. And this mechanistic data, um, I'd be remiss, and Bob would be mad if I didn't, didn't mention, uh, this is a SAM competitive, uh, uh, this is a SAM competitive inhibitor. Um, and it's non-competitive with nucleosome. So when we look back in those cell lines that I showed you just a moment ago with hypertrimethylation of H3K27, what we see is we get very potent and selective cell killing. So here we're looking in um, a Y646F mutant form uh, of, 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 uh, of the enzyme in, w, in this WSU cell line, which again is a GCB subtype of diffuse large B cell lymphoma. And we can see that um, we're getting very robust antiproliferative effects and nice effects on methyl mark, uh, about uh, single-digit nanomolar. In this uh, non-mutant form uh, of EZH2 in this OCL cell line, which is also a GCB subtype, we're getting comparable uh, inhibition of the, of the methyl mark, but you can see the cells, there's, in these cells, there's very little antiproliferative effects. So the, the antiproliferative effects seem to be specific uh, to the mutant cell types. And that's represented more so on, on this graph. 
Here um, on the uh, y-axis, what I'm showing is a metric we use called uh, lowest cytotoxic concentration. So it's a mathematical treatment of uh, antiproliferative data. And what it really means is that um, it's the, the dose at which uh, you induce cell stasis in an 11-day growth assay. So if you're above the LCC, cells are, are, are uh, progressing, are grow, continuing to grow. And if you're below the LCC, you're driving cell death. And so what you see is that the, um, as the mutant uh, GCB um, uh, cell lines tend to be an order of magnitude, and oftentimes two orders of magnitude, more sensitive uh, than non-mutant uh, cell lines. There are two outliers to that statement, here and here. One of them is this RL cell line, which is a 646N mutation, and uh, both uh, our group as well as uh, groups at GSK and at other uh, institutes have reported that this cell line is resistant to EZH2 inhibitors for reasons we don't yet understand. The other outlier is this exquisitely potent, uh, excuse me, exquisitely sensitive uh, cell line, which is actually a follicular lymphoma, uh, and it's this so-called Pfeiffer cell line, which has an, a different type of mutation, A682G. I'm going to come back to that in just a moment, but it seems to be exquisitely sensitive uh, to the EZH2 inhibitor. So we're able to uh, translate the, uh, the effects that we see in cell culture into uh, z uh, nice efficacy in xenograft models. So here we're looking at... Uh, and a, a model of, the, of a Y646 in uh, mutant diffuse large B cell lymphoma. Uh, this is a Carpus cell line, Carpus 422, where we're dosing with uh, uh, increasing doses of, of EZH2 inhibitor, 6438, uh, BID orally, 80 mix per kg, 161 mix per kg, and 322 mix per kg per day. And so this, uh, this drug was very well tolerated in the animals, uh, no obvious uh, effects on body weight or any signs. And what you can see is that you're getting increasing amounts of tumor growth inhibition. And in fact, at these two higher doses, you've really uh, wiped out the tumors. In fact, if we do a washout period, as I showed you in that uh, .1L uh, xenograft study, we can see that these tumors uh, are, remain uh, completely wiped out for an additional uh, 30 days or so in this study. Um, accompanying the uh, efficacy data you see on the right here, uh, very nice PD data. We're looking at trimethylation of H3K27 in the tumor sample using an ELISA assay, and you can see that we're getting nice uh, dose-dependent effects on uh, methylation in the tumor. These are just some other surrogate tissues uh, to show you that we can detect H3K27 methylation modulation in uh, tissues outside of the tumor. Uh, we can see it in, in the PBMCs, we can see in bone marrow, and we can see in, in, in certain skin uh, cell subtypes. Um, it's not to say that all tissues uh, that you see an effect on H3K27, but we certainly have identified some uh, where you could detect that change. So I want to return to uh, this, this story I, I mentioned just a moment ago uh, with the Pfeiffer mutation, the A682G. So there were some uh, additional publication, there was an additional publication that came out from the BCC, BCCA group um, a few years back, as well as a publication from Todd Golub's lab, uh, which identified uh, non-Y641 uh, mutations uh, in non-Hodgkin lymphoma. And there were really just one incident of the, y, of the A682G mutation and one incident of this, uh, uh, one sample of this uh, A682V uh, mutation in this study and only one of the 692, excuse me, 692V mutation in the, in the GALA paper. So it's thought that these mutations were quite rare and they, they are uh, lower frequency than the 646 mutations. Uh, but some uh, recent work from Jude Fitzgibbons uh, was uh, published recently in, in Blood. It's actually presented at ASH last year. But uh, this group identified um, in, a, in a sampling or sequencing of 366 cases that uh, nine of them were A682G and about seven were uh, the 692V uh, uh, mutation. And both, in both cases, this was in follicular lymphoma rather than the uh, diffuse large B cell lymphoma. And so, our group, as well as other groups, have characterized these mutations uh, as we did uh, with the 646 mutation. And again, we see that these are, are change of function mutations. Uh, the 682G, the A682G mutation seems to be particularly robust in uh, using all forms of K27 uh, peptide. So it seems to be a very active form of EZH2. So we believe that, uh, again, that these Pfeiffer um, uh, cells uh, represent a particularly hypersensitive uh, subpopulation of fused large B cell lymphoma. Uh, here we're, we're presenting you with a, a Pfeiffer xenograft study uh, where we're doing just once a day dosing uh, with uh, EPZ6438 uh, in this Pfeiffer cell model uh, xenografted uh, in nude mice. 
And what you see is that uh, at increasing doses of compound, you've really wiped out the tumors at the highest three doses. And at this lower dose, um, you cause uh, a tumor stasis. But if we wash out, we can see the higher doses, you've really got durable regressions. Uh, whereas in this lowest dose, you haven't quite hit the tumor hard enough and the tumors come back uh, during the washout period. So uh, EPC6438 uh, is our clinical candidate. And once again, uh, we've initiated clinical trials uh, with this uh, molecule. Uh, this started in uh, June of this year. Um, the, uh, the trial is currently in a dose escalation phase. Uh, it's with, for patients with advanced solid or hematological uh, malignancies, including EZH2 mutated uh, non-Hodgkin lymphoma. Uh, we currently have two sites uh, active. Uh, one is the IGR in Paris, and another is the Institut Burgundy, and also in, in France. And uh, we're currently looking for our maximum tolerated dose, and we're getting reads on PK and PD. We're hoping uh, in 2014 to move into our expansion phase where we'll start restricting to patients with a re excuse me, relapsed or refractory uh, EZH2 mutated non-Hodgkin lymphoma. And we'll of course be uh, uh, expanding our number of sites on a multinational basis and we'll be looking at measures such as safety and getting an early read on potential therapeutic benefit. So the final story I want to leave you with uh, has to do with additional indications for EZH2. And this is an exciting story uh, in a particular cancer type where there really is uh, unmet need. So I mentioned earlier that one of the uh, uh, prominent ways in which uh, chromatin is regulated is through covalent modifications on histones. But there's another mechanism that involves the so-called chromatin remodeling complexes. And one of the, uh, the, the most well-known uh, members of this uh, uh, chromatin remodeling complex is, is the so-called switch sniff complex, which is shown here. The, uh, the switch sniff complex uh, is conserved among eukaryotes. It's found all the way down to yeast. But it's a very, very big complex that involves up to 14 different proteins. And the composition of this complex in terms of what uh, proteins are, are in the complex can vary quite a bit. There's at least 28 genes encoding these proteins. But this is an ATP-dependent uh, um, uh, complex. And what it essentially does is it's involved in, uh, histone, um, in histone positioning. It actually uh, can aff affect the uh, occupancy of histones at promoters. Uh, but it's been shown by a number of different groups to have a tumor suppressor function. I think it's, it's probably a little bit of an oversimplification to call it a tumor suppressor. But in a number of different contexts, when you have loss of function, of members uh, of, of this complex, it, there are um, oncogenic effects that are observed. So one such case uh, was reported by uh, uh, Charlie Roberts and Stu Orkin a couple of years ago, and that's what got us interested in this story. Um, this group was looking at the, the role of, of switch NIF in its relationship uh, with PRC2, uh, the complex which has EZH2. And what they report in their model is that in a normal circumstance, switch SNF seems to have somewhat of an antagonistic relationship with PRC2. Uh, and that's both at the level of transcription of EZH2 and at the level of the actual polycomb target genes. And so this, uh, this antagonism is important for keeping uh, stem cell programs uh, suppressed. So in the case of a particular type of tumors called rhabdoid tumors, which is a pediatric cancer, which I'll mention in just a moment, um, greater than 90% of these tumors have a biallelic loss of function of a member of the switch SNF complex called SNF5. I should point out that SNF5 has the, uh, has the honor of having more names than you can probably keep up with. It's called uh, SNF5, it's called BAF47, SMARC-B1, and INI1, but it's all referring to the same protein. Uh, so I'll try to, I'll try to, to refer back to those different uh, names. So SMARC-B1, as I mentioned, is, is the same thing as uh, SNF5. But uh, beyond rhabdoid tumor, uh, there's been a recent report as a review from, uh, uh, I believe, from Jerry Crabtree's lab that showed that probably in over, uh, around 20% of all human cancers have some loss of function in members of the switch SNF uh, family. Oh, I should just back up one moment. So in the, in the case of the rhabdoid tumor, um, what, you really, what you have is the loss of function of SNF5. That alleviates the antagonism that switch SNF is having on PRC2 and on the target genes. This causes, um, alleviates the inhibition on stem cell programs, causes potentiation, and ultimately contributes to oncogenic transformation. So just a, a few more points on uh, rhabdoid tumors. Um, so SNF5, as I mentioned, is mutated in about 98% of malignant rhabdoid tumors and in uh, atypical tetroid rhabdoid tumor. 
Um, these are very aggressive tumors. Uh, they're pediatric and they're cancers of the brain, kidney, and soft tissues. And currently, there really is no effective treatment. Uh, it's very sad. The patients generally die within one year of diagnosis. Uh, but another feature of these tumors that, that's quite interesting is that the SNF5 loss of function is really the sole reoccurrent uh, uh, genetic alteration, which really suggests that this uh, particular um, chromatin modulating complex may be a, a, um, a loss of function that is, is a driver in the disease. So we decided to test an EZH2 inhibitor in uh, model cell lines for uh, malignant rhabdoid tumor. And that's what you see here, this G401 cell line. Uh, lacks expression of uh, SNF5, has biallelic uh, loss of SNF5. And what you see is a, a fairly robust uh, cell killing in these cell lines uh, compared to vehicle. You can also contrast this to what we see in, in a control cell line. And I use the term control cell line somewhat uh, loosely here. This is actually a, myo, uh, a rhabdomyosarcoma, which isn't really a, a perfect control, has nothing to do with rhabdoid tumor. But there's really no, there's, there's no examples of, of rhabdoid tumor that, uh, where we can get a hold of where there isn't a biallelic loss of SNF5. So this will have to suffice. But you see there's no effects of the EZH2 inhibitor in the cell line. Uh, when we looked across other cell lines that don't have loss of function of SNF5, we've also seen that they don't respond to the inhibitor. I'm just showing some of those here, some 293Ts and, and another cell line, which have uh, expression of SNF5. When we've looked in other uh, SNF5 mutant cell lines, uh, which don't have any expression, we see that they're generally about an order of magnitude or two more sensitive to the inhibitor. So as far as what's going on uh, at, a, at a more of a mechanistic level, uh, what we see is that in these uh, in these uh, MRT cell lines with SNF5 loss of function, we're inducing a G1 arrest. Uh, it takes a while, it takes about seven days to start to see an arrest in G1. And just following that, you start to see an increase in sub G1 population uh, and tunnel positive cells uh, about around a day 11 and even more so at day 14. If you contrast that to what you see in that RD SNF5 wild type cell line, you can see there's very few effects at all uh, on the cell cycle profile. So again, it's very specific to the SNF5 uh, mutant context. When we've done uh, global transcriptional analysis uh, on uh, SNF5 deleted cells, it's quite profound that the difference at a global level, uh, what you're seeing in terms of, of transcriptional effects. Um, so just looking at a very global level, um, starting around day four, you see a very robust increase in gene expression consistent uh, with alleviation of, of PRC2. Um, uh, enzymatic activity, and that's even more robust by day seven. But you can, can contrast that with what we see uh, at a global level in the SNF5 wild type cell line. Very few changes in gene expression, even out to day seven, only uh, just over 100 or so. So we've been looking more uh, closely at what pathways are being affected in these cells. Uh, what we're observing is that we're, uh, we're normalizing the, uh, uh, the, the canonical dysregulated uh, pathways in MRT. So you see here the hedgehog pathway, which is typically upregulated in MRT, and we're causing downregulation of genes such as GLE-1 and, and PATCH-1 uh, in a time-dependent manner. Uh, we're also upregulating markers of neuronal differentiation, which are typically downregulated in MRT. So we see DOC4 up, CD133 up, and PTPRK up, but only in the G401 cell line. Um, we also see upregulation of tumor suppressors, such as BIN1, cell cycle inhibitors such as P16 and P21, again, only in the, uh, in the mutant uh, context, and then downregulation of the MYC oncogene. So we've been able to show that in xenograft models uh, using the G401 cell line that we do have nice uh, anti-tumor uh, growth inhibition effects uh, in a dose-dependent manner here. Again, dosing BID uh, with 6438, increasing concentrations of the compound. Uh, again, we're dosing for 28 days, doing a washout and looking for durable regression. And you can see at the two higher doses, uh, the tumors are, um, are completely wiped out and don't come back during the washout period, whereas the lowest dose, you can see that we haven't hit the target hard enough. Again, the, the, the drug is very well tolerated, uh, no real effects on body weight. Um, we see nice PD effects, as you see in this uh, immunohistochemistry staining. Uh, we're really blunting uh, H3K27 trimethylation in the tumor and the dosed animals. And uh, we're also seeing similar effects on uh, gene expression, on the neuronal differentiation markers, and on the hedgehog pathway, as we saw in the cell lines. So I just wanted to leave you um, with one additional thought about um, so-called uh, INI1, which is SNF5 uh, deficient tumors. So uh, there's really a spectrum of uh, INI1 deficient tumors, uh, particularly in uh, soft tissue sarcomas. 
and shown here on this graph is is a is a just a flavor of some of these very rare tumor types they consist of things such as epithelial sarcoma synovial sarcoma atypical chordoma and extraskeletal myxoid chondrosarcoma in each of these there's a varying degree of loss of I and I one or SNF5 and so we're hopeful that they may represent additional indications for EZH2 inhibitors and to that point I just wanted to highlight the synovial sarcoma for a moment so in synovial sarcoma there's a hallmark translocation where a gene called SS18 which is located on chromosome 18 is translocated to one of a few genes in the SSX family which is located on chromosome X and you get this fusion product and this is important because SS18 is normally found within the BAF or switch SNF complex it's actually one of the proteins that comprises this complex and it's bound here to BAF47 which again SNF5, INI1, SMART B1 and so what you see in the uh, translocated context is that the, the uh, fusion uh, protein actually binds to uh, the, uh, the switch NIF complex and displaces the endogen, or excuse me, the wild type SS18 and BAF47 or SNF5. And this gets proteolytically degraded and causes a SNF5 deficiency. Um, we've, this is uh, from a review from Jerry Crabtree's lab, uh, lab by the way. Um, I'm not showing the data today, but uh, we've been able to obtain uh, some uh, synovial sarcoma cell lines, and we're seeing uh, very nice anti-proliferative effects in those cell lines, and we're hoping to uh, continue to expand those studies and investigate further in the clinic uh, synovial sarcoma as an indication for EZH2 inhibitors. So we're very hopeful in, in, that, uh, in that area. So I hope that I've, I've given you a feel for uh, what Epizyme's uh, philosophy is on drug discovery. Uh, we're starting with uh, genetically defined uh, cancer indications where there is sensitivity to a given HMT, doing our drug discoveries for that HMT, and then using uh, cell models and xenograft models uh, for those uh, genetically defined cancers, and then, uh, then translating that uh, hopefully into clinical efficacy as well. And so with that, uh, I want to thank uh, uh, all the folks who were involved in this, uh, with this data, and there's, there's quite a few of them sh shown here. The folks at Epizyme and Discovery are shown in this column, uh, and, and development and clinical at Epizyme here. These are academic excuse me, collaborators, Scott Armstrong and Catherine Burnt. And then uh, finally, our colleagues at ASI uh, who are involved in the uh, clinical development of the EZH2 inhibitor. So I'll close with that and take any questions. burning question then I'll sure. uh, turn it over to the other guys so um, <clears throat> mild dysplastic syndrome mm -hmm. has you know reasonably high frequency of easy mm -hmm. mutations mm -hmm. that really look to be loss of function mm -hmm. local mm -hmm. micro deletions or yeah like inactivation mm -hmm. so first of all that's interesting yeah these are clearly gain of function those are loss of function mm -hmm. two different hemolinces and the other but the other so it'd be interesting here would you think about that but also does it in some way represent a caveat mm -hmm. uh, for sustained mm -hmm. inhibition of EZH2? Yeah, it's a good point. Um, so it, uh, it's very true that EZH2 is not uh, just strictly an, an, an oncogene. There are, there are cases where it seems to be more of a tumor suppressor. There's also the, uh, the work the, from David Alice's uh, lab on the histone mutations and inhibition of EZH2 and uh, glioblastoma. Um, what I would say to that is, is two things. One is that uh, very often those mutations are in the context of other mutations, other drivers, and so it's unclear that EZH2 is the sole genetic, uh, mutation is the sole genetic event in, in MDS. Um, the other thing I would point out is that we're, we're hoping that uh, in our clinical trials to really be in acute dosing and not in chronic dosing, but we'll just have to wait and see. Um, but in general, we just have to be aware of those, those caveats and really keep our eye out for um, you know, anything um, that pops up uh, related to that. Thanks. Yeah. So Jesse, yeah. Uh, the washout experiment where the tumor's gone and yeah. then you looked at methylation, did you guys go back and monitor various tissues for their methylation return? And is <clears throat> one, and number two is when you did look across the tissues, were there any tissues that seemed refractory to the drug? To it coming back. There are definitely tissues where you do not see inhibition of methylation. Um, for example, um, the, uh, if you look within the skin, uh, in the hair follicle, you see no inhibition of H3K27 methylation, but in a layer of the epidermis, you do see it. So some of this uh, is, can be explained by two things. One is that EZH1 
um, you know, is, it does have an expression pattern that's different from EZH2. They're not completely redundant. So in some tissues, there, there might be some redundancy there. It's also true that just basically different tissues are going to have different amounts of drug on board. Uh, we have looked at different tissues to see, you know, what the bounce back is for, for the methylation. Um, you can detect a comeback, say, in PBMCs, and it doesn't come back at the same rate in all tissues, but, and certainly not all tissues have the same sensitivity. Yeah. So, e excellent presentation. I have a question regarding your Jerkat experiment. I'm sure many people ask the same question. For the, the what, what experiment? The, the Jerkat experiment. Oh, Jerkat, sorry, yes. The, the dotyl inhibitor uh, inhibits both the rearrange and the Jerkat methylation mm -hmm. at the same level. Mm -hmm. So, can you comment uh, whether there is the same gene transcription effects uh, and why Jerkats are, re, uh, you know, refractory to mm -hmm. uh, this drug while they, you know, right. targeting this uh, substrate? Right. So Scott Armstrong has really done a lot of work in understanding what dot one L is doing in a in a non rearranged context, and you know I think the the sort of short answer is uh, it's really only a fine tuner in the non rearranged context. It may fine tune elongation, but doesn't seem to be a master regulator. I think that's the way I would describe it. So that only in the rearranged context where you're recruiting it where it's not supposed to be. And, and starting to get aberrant methylation, are you conferring sensitivity? You just don't, when you look um, at, at the genes that are affected by a dot one l inhibitor uh, in a non-rearranged cell line, uh, there's just a very few genes that are affected. It's, it's only a, a very small handful, and, and uh, where you, it, when you do the chip seek with that, and Armstrong's published on this, um, there's just not a lot of effects uh, on, those, on those genes. Not really. I mean, like actin is one of the ones that loses methylation and probably doesn't have an effect on gene expression. There are some where there's both an effect on uh, the methylation and gene expression, but there's nothing you can really say about them as to, you know, uh, that they're pro-survival or have any sort of canonical pathway. Yeah. Bruce? Is, is the uh, me mechanism of tumor regression is it differentiation? That's a great question. So that's something we're really studying a lot right now. You're talking about for dot one I assume? Yes. Yeah. So the answer is yes, it's both. <laughs> so we, what we see is that uh, it's, it really seems to be a differentiation effect where there's a very, it's very temporarily, uh, not very temporarily, uh, uh, excuse me, let me rephrase it. it the, the, the timing of onset of apoptosis seems to be very close to the onset of differentiation. At least that's in tissue culture. Now. That may not be the same in patients. Uh, we just don't know yet. But what we're at least seeing in tissue culture dishes is that you're inducing markers of differentiation. You're inducing um, a phenotype of differentiation by microscopy. But very soon thereafter, you're starting to induce apoptosis. It's hard to temporarily disconnect them. Lou. So there's all sorts of um, deletions, mutations of various chromatin mod modifying mm -hmm. uh, components in cancer. Mm -hmm. Is it the case that it's just this particular SWI sniff complex that is antagonizing PRC2 or or others? Yeah, so we've so with regard to the switch sniff complex, um, let me let me say one thing first thing is that we don't think that all situations where you have some loss of function or change of functions in switch NIF, are you going to be sensitive to EZH2? And that's, that's the definitely the true. And, and is, that, is that the question you're asking? Exactly. Yeah. No, that's fine. So in, in, in some of the, uh, in some of the uh, epithelial cancers that we've looked at, like lung, they don't seem to be as sensitive to an EZH2 inhibitor. And it may be because the, you know, there's just so many other um, you know, uh, genetic aberrations in those cancers that it's just not as clean. I have one other uh, quick kind of technical question. So for the for the dot one trials, as you said, the MLL rearrangements were good at detecting those with routine yeah. genetics, but the PTDs are cryptic. So yeah, they are. And a lot of clinical labs struggle with yeah. PCR based or Sanger yeah. based. So. Um, how are you going to, are you going to handle that? And it's a great question. I mean, we've really been talking to a lot of advisors uh, and folks and, and clinicians about how to pursue this. And so uh, we're, we're, we're looking into that uh, right now. I don't think I have a definitive answer for you, but uh, it probably is going to have to be something that's, uh, that's PCR-based. But uh, yeah, it, it's something that we're really looking into because there's, there's just no easy solution there.